And of course, when there are the metaphysicians that say, well, every aspect, every relationship is actually you and actually your consciousness. Everything is what you believe being demonstrated to you. And this is why manifesting within that metaphysical composite is all about what you believe is what you experience. But at a certain point to expand beyond that and into fifth dimensionality and beyond, the human must be willing to say, I don't know what to believe. And I'm now interested in creating beyond belief. And this is where you really begin to bring new and somewhat miraculous expressions, ideas and concepts into your field of awareness. You're no longer interested in the game of how reality is reflecting it back to you because you stop looking for the results, you stop looking for the instant feedback and your focus is now on what else is emerging, what else is emerging, what else is emerging. Hi, I'm Rebecca Dawson, and this is Your Superior Self. Rebecca, thank you so much for taking the time. I'm so excited for you to be here today. I'm really interested in creating a newer reality, and I think you are the authority on that. So thank you so much for joining. Well, thank you for having me. I'm excited to share what we all know within inherently, but perhaps we have forgotten. <sighs> I'm so glad you said that, because I... I always hear that. I always hear everything that you need is within you. It's nice to say, but like, what does that mean? Well, I feel that we're so engaged with our external reality and all the rules and conditions of how we should be playing the game of life and all the things that are required from us that we're not spending a lot of time listening to the innate intelligence in our biology and in our energy fields and in our collective consciousness that has far more wisdom than what's currently available in our external experience. How do you hear that though? Like, how do you, how do you hear that wisdom? How do you discern that wisdom? How do you know that it is helping you and guide you along this path? It's really, it's something that is felt. And this is where a lot of people speak about gut feeling or a sixth sense just a knowing in their bodies we, we tend to dismiss the intelligence of our biology for knowing things and being able to navigate us through life and we defer to the mind which of course is so heavily programmed and full of memory and strategy so when we feel in our bodies whether something is appropriate for us or not it doesn't give us a yes or a no because that's very dualistic. Our mind will always give us a spreadsheet. If we want to do something, it'll say, well, these are the pros and these are the cons. And then the mind gets very busy going through and making dualistic lists, which is why so many of us get stuck in indecision and don't continue to evolve and grow and have more experience as often as we can. But when we make decisions from the body and the body's intelligence, which is really how source consciousness expresses through us at a most basic level. It's either uh, an expansion and a, an enthusiasm that we feel, everything starts to light up, or it's neutrality. And a lot of people say, well, I've tuned into my body and there's either an expansion or a contraction. But we want to be very clear that when there's a contraction, it's really fear-based. And the source intelligence that we are is not fear-based. So when there's a fear-based sense about something, it's usually the mind because the mind is wired for survival and instinct. The body is wired for evolution and expansion. So I always like to use the um, example of, a, a, I think, a flashlight. We call it a torch in Australia, a flashlight. And so you're going along in the dark in life. And when the flashlight comes on, it's lighting a direction for you. And we feel that in ourselves. We feel excited when something new comes along or, or a new person comes along and, or a new opportunity and everything lights up inside of us. That's your cosmic consciousness saying this way and it's lighting the way for you. And then maybe a 
little bit down the path, suddenly the light goes off, there's a neutrality. And so this is where we stop and we wait and we start to turn around and what other pathways are available and we wait till the flashlight comes on. And this is a fantastic way to really navigate through life and even at a very um, minimal level to navigate through your day because we're so scheduled that we're not listening to what's the right or what's the most energy efficient and expansive direction for us today. Mm. So one thing I like to do is write myself a list of all the things I need to do today. That's my mind bit out of the way. And then I look at that list and which one has got, the, which thing in that list is the light shining on at this moment? Which, which part of this list has my energy, my body got energy for? And then I engage with that and everything gets done so quickly with very little effort. And then we scan again. Which which aspect is there energy on today? Hmm. So would you say that you're a conscious creator right now? Or is there still things that manifest that you're unconsciously creating that surprise you? That's such a great question. I feel that I haven't quite mastered the conscious creation game yet. I feel like I'm learning and I'm getting there. But I am able to distinguish now between when I'm witnessing creation happen or if I'm just unconscious to what's happening around me. And so when I'm witnessing creation happening, I'm in awe of it. I'm, wow, look at this. Look what happened in this moment. And it could be something so simple. It could be an email. It could be a bird that flies onto the balcony and starts singing. But the witnessing is so important because we're either witnessing creation or we're unconscious to creation, which is when we're in our day and our mind's just very task driven and strategic and future or past oriented. Whereas creation only ever happens in the present moment. So when we're witnessing, those are the moments where we start to feel life. And when we're witnessing creation, we are actually in the co-creation experience with it. And I love this, and I'm, I'm, just, I'm just really playing with this myself at the moment on a daily experience because there's this question, does creation happen without there being a witness to it? That's a good question. I mean, if yeah. the observer effect, right? Like, the observer but effect. what if the observer is the thing, the mechanism that collapses the potential, right? Like, let's say your future is in superposition, right? And you are the observer. How do you collapse the future that you want? Now, if you have unconscious programming, a key indicator of your future is your past, right? Like, you keep reliving the, the same programs. Right. And you keep reliving the same fears. You keep re reliving the same techniques and strategies that you've been practicing your entire life that get you to this moment. But if your future is in superposition to where uh, you can manifest a life of your dreams or a life of desire or life of abundance or prosperity, how do you collapse that potential? Do you mean collapse it into the present moment? Sure. And then I guess to, to what bring is, it to the now. yeah, bring it to the, the, the future or not bring the, the collapse, the, the superposition into the moment, but then also mm -hmm. realize the indicators that it is working. Well, everything about 3d reality, of course, is slow. It's process driven because 3d reality is like stretching out a moment so that you can see it in slow motion replay. And the masters have described this so beautifully, it really changed the way I looked at life, where they say that everything that happens within your earth reality, you're watching a slow motion replay. So hmm. creation has already happened. In our minds, we play it out to watch it happen. Like a goal gets kicked. Oh, that's amazing. But we go back and then we can really appreciate how it happened. So our minds in this human expression likes to reverse they, the mind likes to reverse engineer everything so that's why we get this stretch out future effect so if we think well one day i want to have this beautiful successful life whatever that is to you the mind then goes and tries to reverse engineer it and says well these are the steps that i have to take 
but the mind can only view that possibility in terms of a memory that it already has. It can only reference it based on what it already has in its program. So if you have an idea of a successful life, those images likely that you have of that are something you've already seen somewhere or someone has already done. So because of that, we know that the potentials and possibilities for that particular version of life are already available within the collective human blueprint because you have a memory for it. So if it's already available there, it's not so easy to, to, it's not so difficult to experience, but the mind already knows about it. So it's happening in a very slow motion replay way. In those cases, it can be, it can take time. But if you really want to manifest something new that nobody has really experienced before or that you haven't experienced before, and this is what many conscious people are doing here in this reality at this time, is seeding new things for humans to experience, new concepts and ideas. These things are not viewed in retrospect because there's no memory for them already which means that they come up spontaneously within you and they come up as a feeling state. This is going back to the intelligence of the body because that's the easiest interface we have. And then it arises as a thought. Now, in that experience, the mind says, well, I now want to make that material. But as soon as we do that and start going through the strategy of how to do it, we're, we're stretching it out into a slow motion replay, which is why so many um, amazing manifestors, particularly in the 90s that we're talking about, well, have, a, have an idea and have a desire and then let it go. They were onto something there because if the mind releases itself from trying to figure out how to do that, that concept or idea is far more likely to begin to manifest itself in your reality without any effort far more quickly. And it can do that by appearing magically in full form or the right people that you require that will come together to create, create that as a team, start showing up in your field. There are little bits of it that start coming to you rather than you having to go out on a journey to put it together. And this is so interesting because this is our magnetic self. When we start using the body intelligence like this instead of the mind intelligence, we start operating in a magnetic way that brings everything to us instead of us having to go out into time to go on a journey to collect the pieces that we need. <laughs> were you talking like this when you were a little girl and, and your guides were teaching you this information? Um, well, I always had an awareness of myself in other experiences in the earth reality. So I often thought that I was a man or a priest when I was quite young. Really? <laughs> yeah, I never really lost the ability to have those memory imprints of where I was or who I was before. But as far as the masters coming through and speaking about the the technicalities of reality that didn't happen till till i was in my late teens and early 20s so what age did you start having these i guess recalling these memories these past life memories and then like what was your experience of reality like then well, right from the beginning um right out of the womb Pop. yeah very <laughs> early and i have very early memories like i I actually remember breastfeeding when I was young and I was, I think I was only breastfed up to about six months. Right. So, so I have some, some really early memories there, but the memories of other places and other spaces, some of those were here, most of them in e what you would call Egypt or what I later learned was the Atlantean experience. So I have a lot of very vivid memory about that. Um, all sorts of things, society and architecture and technology, that kind of thing. Um, but then I also have memories of being in courts around Europe and being quite influential there um, in the back in the back scenes. Um, but also of other places and other spaces that aren't that aren't um, familiar to Earth. Mm. So any of those past lives have a direct result to your capabilities and abilities or talents in this life, right? Like being able to channel like higher beings from different dimensions. I feel so because particularly the one that I had in Atlantis, uh, the, I was 
I have a memory of being one of the priests there and the priests or we, we I'm using the word priest very loosely because I have a Catholic background. Um, the, the spiritual ones who were leading the councils there, they were also the scientists. We were also the scientists. And that when I began to become more clear about that memory, I realized that well, what we were actually doing was we were bringing science to humanity in this way. I feel like the science back then or whenever that was, I mean, I use time like it was in the past, but really, I mean, who really knows? Like, I feel like it would be a lot different than how we experience science today. Like our science today is very objective and it can be a religion of sorts because of the dogma that's associated with that. How is science different from now than it was versus when you were Atlantean? Well, it was very much based on the natural movements of the field in and around the earth and the natural movements of the field in and around the human body, which was considered to be a model of or representation of the field of the earth as well. And this is, of course, why some of the sciences became very influential to what was happening in the human psyche and experience because what was being done with the earth's fields was also happening for the human's fields as well. You couldn't really separate out the two, which is why, in essence, when the human, the earth field became so disrupted, the DNA and the experience of the human also became incredibly disrupted. Mm. So you couldn't really separate out the two. So there was much more of a focus on the magnetic principles and fusion energy, fusion energy rather than fission because of the magnetic focus. Whereas now we tend to focus more on electrical connection. Everything is linear. Um, it's a different principle. You're sending energy and uh, relaying energy through messaging rather than moving into a state of resonance, which of course is non-local and it doesn't require such systems of in infrastructure. Amazing. How do you experience reality personally? Like how do you experience this reality right now? Well, I'm, I, I, straddle to <laughs> straddle to versions i guess two or more because and the challenge that's the challenge for me particularly because i still have the human experience and i've had quite a dramatic life i've had a, I've, I've been through a lot of the the human dramas and you could pretty much tick all of the most basic human what we call human traumas i think i've experienced most of them and that actually surprises people when they hear that they think well how is it First, first thing they say is, well, if, you're, if you've got these guides and, you know, you have all of this spiritual awareness, what are you doing wrong that you would be going through all of these things? Hmm. And I often ask myself that when I was a lot younger. Why is life so difficult and why do all these things seem to happen? And, of course, my awareness now is different. Now I realise, well, if I didn't have such an intense human experience, I wouldn't actually be able to impart and assist you with humanity with what we're going through if I didn't know what it was to go through all of those things. So I know fear and anxiety very, very well. I know, you know, what it feels like to feel depressed and all of those things. And the challenge is to know that, I'm the barometer of those things that human, humans experience. Therefore, I'm also experiencing it because I'm in a collective field with humanity. But there's also all of this available in this collective field as well. So it's always a choice. Where do I want to focus on this day? Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's like being pulled around in the, in the undertow of the ocean. But it, at the end of the day, it's, it's my conscious choice. Do I want to focus on this, the, the human problem and the problem of myself, or do I want to focus on what's available? So I, I experience both. How do you experience relationships here, being a channeler <laughs> and, and being a manifester? Like, do you have a typical, I mean, I say typical, but like, do you have like normal relationships? Do you have like personal relationships, romantic relationships? How do you sift those? How do you maneuver through those waters? Like, because I feel like it's you such... receive you receive such wonderful information from the cosmos, and it's like a lot of people kind of aren't ready for, or maybe to be in a relationship with someone that is of that nature, right? Like it scares some people. Right, <laughs> and it's not just in intimate relationships; it's also in friendships as well. So I, I do feel I had quite a hard time with that. I, I had a difficult time with that, particularly in school, in high school. 
I was at a Catholic school and when I started to speak to some friends once at, you know, like a sleepover uh, about some of the things that I experienced, um, it didn't go down very well at all. So I, I, I think I got, I feel I got through my teens and 20s and into university playing the part of being a regular person that goes out to pubs and listens to music and drinks beer. And then another part of me was of this very private part which my family knew about and I had some select friends, but mostly my friends have always been so much older than me because I found that people who were in their 50s and 60s, and this is way back when I was you know, early 20s, they were more interested in this sort of thing. So that's been a balancing act, but what I'm finding now is, um, and I'm, I'm in my late 40s now, um, is that it's like the collective consciousness of humanity is rising now. And so I feel like I have now an abundance of, of great relationships and friends um, who are interested in this kind of thing. And we have conversations about this, you know, perhaps over a glass of wine or something like that. So that's wonderful. But as far as partnering goes, yes, that's a challenge. And, and it's a challenge not because it's a challenge to find somebody who, who sees the world in a similar way as you, but that there's plenty of people who would be very interested in partnering, I feel, with somebody who feels that has all the answers. Mm. Codependency. Right. So wow. that's that's been interesting as well. Well, do you have all the answers? <laughs> <laughs> I am in awe and wonder of what new can arise today, just like you are. But I am very lucky because I have, I, I do have a wonderful partner who, who, um, who is very interested in what I do as well. And we actually met at a seminar discussing this kind of thing twenty five years ago, okay, and have cool. recently, recently reconnected. That's yeah. awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, how do we, <clears throat> like, to your point about? going out and having relationships, going to social events that uh, I feel like we do out of like, it's our nature of, as social beings that we go and, you know, include ourselves and, in, you know, in the community, in the neighborhood. And some people might not resonate with that. I think that was the hardest thing for me. It wasn't like, oh, I'm too good for this conversation, but it's like, I don't want to talk about the same stuff anymore. Like, there's just nothing that like, I just... I don't know. I feel like it it takes a lot of effort on my behalf to uh have certain conversations with people because it's it just doesn't resonate or hit the same as it used to, right? Um I, I'm not after the same type of goals or or trends that you see in society as far as like materialistic successes, I feel like are far different than what they used to be for me. So I guess that's the tricky part for me in navigating my spirituality is really having um, quality conversations because there's a fear associated with that, that if I out myself, right, of these, the topics that I'm interested in, how about you? Like there is a fear of um, ostrac ostrac being ostracized, right, from the group. I mean, that's an, that's an evolved um, fear from for yes. being a human. Um, how do people like navigate that for themselves, right? Like when they're going out into the community or into social events, um, and they feel like they want to have more quality conversations, but they feel like they may be, uh, met, uh, either by resistance or energies that don't support that. That's well, such a great question because you and I have both ex have experienced a lot of that in our lives. I'm sure <laughs> as many of your listeners probably do too. So it's an interesting thing because, you know, and the masters will often say that, that the fear of not belonging is actually the greatest fear that humans have. And it's what perpetuates the belief systems that we, we move around in, even though we innately know that we've outgrown them. So we often have this idea that we're on the outside because if you are like you are or like I am, our experience in life is that we're sitting on the periphery and we're really just trying to get in. <laughs> <laughs> 
because that's where everyone is and we want to be we want to be included and we, we're trying to break in to to this human experience in some way so we break into life and we never quite get there and it wasn't really until I was in my mid-30s that I that I was I was really struggling to have friends and to make friends and I thought well gosh I'm a nice person and I'm super friendly but for some reason I'm always on the outer and as much as I try and small talk it's it's just not it's not landing somehow. <laughs> yep. And what I realized was that I had been doing things the wrong way around, or I had been inverting how things really are. And I love this because everything in this reality is inversion. We can flip everything on its head. And I, I had the awareness, well, I've spent all this time on the outside trying to get in. Why don't I just be at the center and see who wants to come join me? So rather than trying to belong to other people, which never worked out for me, I consciously decided to see if I could just be completely authentic. And sometimes that doesn't mean saying anything. It just means showing up in your energy and really owning the fact that you exist and you have a right to be here. I wonder who's going to start to be attracted to me. And that's that magnetic effect. And far out within like weeks of doing this and just showing up and saying nothing, suddenly all of these people started to gather around, but they weren't inviting me to events. They were saying, hey, I was just wondering, could I come and have a coffee with you? Or, um, yeah, I was just wondering, would you like to go for a walk? And sure enough, what they really wanted was to have an authentic conversation. Hmm. And and actually that's how that's how the community around me really grew was from that. Sure. Yeah. I'm I'm learning how to have more authentic conversations without sounding like a converter, <laughs> you know, like come to over here with me. Cause I just, I've had, I have such trauma with like, just, you know, religiosity of people having conversations and, you know, you need to come be this, this, uh, version of Christianity cause it's the right way or you need to be saved or blah, blah, blah. Right. Like you need to do these to get to the promised land. I just feel like there's some trauma associated with that. And I, now that I'm finding my own truth, I don't want to be that guy who's like, Hey dude, have you thought about reincarnation? Like, have, you know what I mean? Like, I don't, I mean, I don't mind talk. Like, I love talking about that stuff, but I just, there's just this trauma associated with it. Like, I don't want to be that guy who's like pushing reincarnation with people if they're not ready to hear it because people just start slanting their eyes and they start, um, kind of, you know, I don't know. My wife is like, stop being that weird guy. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> I don't know if that makes sense. Oh, it does. But you, and and you're you're so right, especially when we try and talk about things that are conceptual to other people. It's a concept to them. It's not their reality. And so, what I find is always a really beautiful way to start a conversation and bring the things that you're interested in to the table is I always start with being human. Hmm. And how do those concepts and ideas relate to your human experience? Because that's something that people can get into so quickly. And even something as being as authentic and vulnerable to say, you know, I had a really tough day today and this is what I was feeling. And yet I realized that so many people are feeling this. Do you think there's something in that, that there's like a collective field of consciousness that perhaps we're oscillating in? And so that human aspect is what, makes it interesting and approachable for people people can can relate to that because we're all having a human experience but when it's a concept that's oh what's out there and this is the mechanics of reality and how it works it's, it's difficult for people to feel that it's got anything to do with them if it's not their current reality mm. you're so smart well, I, I don't know that I'm smart. I think that I'm walking the two the two lines, and sure. my great challenge has been uh, how how do you how do you do this without jumping off a cliff? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Well, I, then it then it also goes to like how do you live in this experience in that energy, but still manifest the reality or collapse that potential in the moment, right? Like if you're trying to recreate a career. And you're surrounded by the energies that have kept you in the same career. How do you navigate those waters where you're you're actively manifesting a newer career or the career that you desire, right? And without taking on those those energies that are, have kept you there for so long, if that makes sense. Oh, that's such a great question. Thank you for asking that because I think that fear of 
of letting go of the known is one of the biggest things that prevents us from living in the new. And I will speak of it from a personal perspective because Absolutely. I, I feel you and I know what that feels like. You feel me. You can feel the energy. Yes. And, and I know what that feels like. But when we're speaking about really coming into our greatness, because this for you is about coming into your greatness, being able to express and expand and continually evolve your own consciousness through the work that you do, which is actually what we're really here for. <laughs> so why shouldn't we be doing that um, as our principal vocation, our principal work? So for you and for people who come to that point, it's not really a question of, well, do I want to leave this job and move to another job? Or I'm earning money here, but I might not be earning money there in the beginning. It, it, it becomes so important to you that it's now a question of life and death. Because when I'm in this job that gives me a regular paycheck, I don't feel like I'm alive. And yet when I'm doing something that I really love, that's interesting and stimulating to me, I can feel my expansion, my expansion happening. I'm coming back to life. My body recognizes that this is what keeps me alive, which means that your body intelligence, this is taking us back to the beginning of the conversation, is saying to you, this is life affirming. And then we, we have to go into a state of trust where, well, if this is life affirming, this is my soul consciousness or this is my greater wisdom saying to me this is where life is going to flourish for me and it does because money is a residual effect of life flourishing and so is expansion in every area of your life so i i feel it's a life or death question a hundred percent Swinging from vine to vine through the, I'm just being given this image by the master, swinging vine, vine from vine through the jungle like Tarzan, you kind of have to almost let go of one rope to grab the other one. <laughs> but the thing is, Tarzan's by himself. He doesn't have his three kids hanging on his leg. <laughs> oh, responsibility. You know, the greatest responsibility in terms of leadership is the responsibility to the evolution of your consciousness. Because if you're evolving your consciousness and you're expanding, everyone that's with you goes with you. Hmm. That's magnetic fields. That's another Atlantean principle. <laughs> so what does that mean? Like, is that mean, going to expand with you? So if you're expanding your your consciousness, right? You take a leap of faith and you leave. Let's say you take that leap. What happens next, right? Like, what happens next is in terms of other people around you and responsibility. Yeah is that those who are ready to expand and evolve with you see that as leadership and they go with you and you actually change the reality for everyone. Hmm. So, you know, you can lead from the back of the line, which is what a lot of humans have learned to do, particularly in families. Say you've got a group of people walking up a mountain. We've learned that leadership is being very responsible and being at the back of the line, carrying everyone's bags and pushing people up the line. Go that way, go that way, we're okay. And you see this particularly in families, is that you, you hold the responsibility and the burden and you're trying to get everyone up the mountain. And it's very difficult to lead from the back because everyone's kind of going off in their own direction. It's like herding cats, which is what kids can be like, right? <laughs> or families. And all the things you're trying to juggle but you know real leadership is being at the front of the line and when you're at the front of the line first of all you're not carrying all the bags because you're leading but you can see very clearly ahead of you and you are going where your consciousness is saying we're going to go here we're going to go this way now we're going to go this way and everybody follows that's leadership yeah i love that but finding that path, right, is following your body or listening to your body being that barometer for your soul development or your soul and, you know, data coming from your higher self and feeling which direction to go into. How do we, in this reality, strengthen that sensitivity in our bodies, right? Like, how do we become the best antenna that we can? Is it through meditation? Is it through diet? Is it through um, being an ascetic? And basically, um, 
releasing all of our attachments to to desires, right? Like how do we become the best antenna so that way we can pick up the most effective signals or the most um, efficient signals that we can um, pursue in our lives to get us to the end goal? That's such a great question. And I feel that firstly, it's an awareness that you exist with multiple intelligences. There's an intelligence of the body, which is your innate biology and that which knows how to live. And that's where all our life essence is. And then there's an intelligence of a programmable memory-based and strategic mind. Now the mind can be a tool for the intelligence in your body. Once you're aware of it and you're deferring to physiological decisions and then the mind is being directed by that that's a great tool but in the beginning we are in a society where we're actually denying our bodies right from the very beginning and you see this within religious practices you see it within all sorts of things you learn when you're a child you know you don't go to sleep when you're tired <laughs> stay focused stay alert so you're very very quickly taught to defer to the the mind intelligence rather than the body intelligence so once we realize there's two then you can start having a daily practice of actually sitting and for some people it's a meditation for others it's just an awareness how is my body feeling in this moment and it's a great game because when you go to the supermarket and i do <laughs> do this all the time do i want this brand of olives or do i want this brand of olives and if you watch your mind will say well this one's got this ingredients in it and this one's got this ingredients and this is the price per gram and that's your mind making that dualistic list of comparison but if you actually just close your eyes and feel your body there's energy for one of them and there's not energy for the other one mm -hmm. And that's how you start to practice making choice from the intelligence of your body, because your body always knows what is the greatest expanse of possibility for you in that moment. What about alcohol? <laughs> what about wine and beers? You know, like people I could, I could like to have a good time. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, those sorts of activities are partaken in. Why? Because what it does is it actually changes the mind. So it quite either quietens the mind down or it relaxes the mind or it perks the mind up, but it's all begins with the problem of the mind. We don't really like how the mind is right now. So yes, there's effects on the body, but it's principally des designed to, to dull the mind or to alter the mind in some way. Sure. Which is that, fascinating that because we think hit. that that's the only intelligence that we have. Sure. Dopamine hits, right? Even with right. like foods, you know, desserts, um, sugar, all of that, like ultra processed foods, the snacks, the chips, it's all to get a hit of that dopamine and uh, feel better about ourselves, right? But if you're implementing like practices in your life that makes you more sensitive to energies and implement um practices that connect you with that higher part of yourself wouldn't that naturally like feed you better stimulating experiences anyway yes it does but we are still in the human experience and we're still existing within a collective human consciousness that is full of blueprints and programmings that we we are swimming in it so yes we're waking up within it but we're still swimming in it so it's still i believe a great deal of diligence that is required <laughs> and uh and focus and practice every day to know well there's this and there's this and that's just another permut permutation of duality of course but in that there's choice am mm -hmm. i choosing from this or am i choosing from this in this moment so with your capabilities, are you a seer too? Can you see timelines and, and future outcomes, possi possible future outcomes? Yeah, sometimes. I mean, very clearly, yes, when I'm in channel, specifically if, if we're having an interaction with someone, we, we can see not just one particular timeline because everything's multidimensional, of course, but all the different sets of possibilities.
and in the past as well, because they're all available in the current moment. And this is another thing about the intelligence of the body. The mind can't do that so easily, but the body can. It has awareness of all of those possibilities and potentials. Mm -hmm. And because it has awareness of all the possibilities and potentials for you, it's the best intelligence to choose. <laughs> well, I always wondered about that because like you, you go to psychics or you go to um, people that can see oracles, seers, whomever you, however you want to label them, right? Like I always wondered if it is really them seeing a possibility or is it them telling you something great about yourself that makes you feel good and then you believe it and then you create it? Oh, you've asked the, you've asked the big question and I'm so happy that you did. Thank you. So what we would say to that is this, when we really understand how creation works and it works in the present moment and that which is, is observed enables a creation to be, a creation also requires an observer. Let's look at the ancient oracles. So kings would come to them and they would say, should I invade this country or what should we do with this kingdom here? And the oracle would go into their state and they would say, this is what I see. Now, the question here, because those decisions, they changed history. Or did they create? So are they seeing or are they creating in that moment? And is it one and the same? Hmm. Because there are so many potentials, there are infinite potentials, but when someone who has, you know, psychic abilities or a seer or someone in a position like an oracle can, can zone in on one of those potentials, then so many energies become engaged with that potential that it actually manifests it into our material reality. And this is why belief is so important. How do you get rid of those old beliefs though, right? Like that are resisting your creation of that reality this program you can't really you can't really get rid of beliefs because they exist within a collective field well what the belief that you're not is, worthy right like the belief that you're not worthy the belief you right. can't have this well you you never really get rid of that the question is how is it that i no longer have that as my default belief because that belief still exists in the collective field and then the question is, what now what do I focus on? Is there a new belief for me? And this is why we always encourage people, rather than focusing on getting rid of things out of their system, let's get rid of this belief, let's get rid of this block, let's get rid of this trauma, let's create a new belief, let's create a new way of doing things, let's create a new focus. Because it's actually far more efficient to create something new than to get rid of something old because nothing actually ever really dies in the universe. Mm -hmm. It's just a question of where you put your attention. So you keep saying we, are you channeling now? Uh, I am having some assistance. Yes. And, <laughs> and who is assisting you? Who are your, who are your guides? So we have a team of masters that come, that come through. Uh, that's Seraphist Bay, St. Germain and Kusumi. Uh, but I also recognize them as aspects of source. So sometimes I refer to them as other aspects of the multidimensional one. But they have uh, they have names and identities so that they can be discerned. Do that yeah, that's what was, that's what I was gonna ask is the names just so that we can understand who they are, right? Like I've heard yes. a lot of people say they channel Saint Germain, however, the other two, this is the first that I'm hearing of those. Um, did they help you when you were smaller, like as a young girl, did they come into your life or and help you? Yes. Uh, although I didn't recognize the names or have a clearer understanding as I do now, but Serapis Bay most certainly, um, was always there when I was young and that was the Egyptian and Atlantean influence for me. So, uh, I think that was, I related so much to that energy always being next to me that I realized that I identified as that. So I always thought that I was this, you know, this very serious alchemist type, you know, from alchemist, <laughs> alchemist. From, uh, I love that. E Egypt or Atlantis. I, cause I could feel, I could feel that with me all the time. Do you see them in your physical reality? No, no, you just feel them. 
yeah I just feel them and and the energy is so integrated now that it's just like you know when you have a conversation in your head with yourself or with someone else it's mm -hmm. like that so it's just a con it's a con it's a continual conversation and when you channel do you does Rebecca the persona stay here or do you go somewhere else my persona steps aside and then they begin to speak through me so where does your awareness like go I'm still there. I'm still watching. And it's actually awesome. I wish I was a graphic designer or animator so I could capture it. But really? um, yeah, so when we go into channel and you hear the explanation in words, I get a multidimensional animation of what they're talking about. And quite often it's way beyond the little stream that they're expressing. Do they ever give like practicalities of how we can create or is it generally spoken in metaphors and or um stories so that way we can connect the dots it's it there's a lot of metaphor and story in there to help the mind grasp something that's ungraspable by the mind but they also give very practical exercises and experiences we, we do seminars and workshops on manifesting and and First of all, we give we give something to the mind to keep the mind happy so that it can understand the concept. And then there's an experiential component. And of course, that's that's then bringing in the body intelligence because only the body intelligence knows how to do it. The mind doesn't know how to do it. Mm -hmm. And then people begin to have an experience. And then from that, they can create their own dialogue or explanation or, well, this is the mechanism that works for me or this is, this is how it works. How it goes so are your goals like your actual goals or are they your spirit guide goals uh well we would hmm. you mean goals for people to to manifest like say things that you let's say the persona that is rebecca in this reality right now like depending upon how much you identify with that like I don't know if you have personal goals or like things that you still desire to want I to think, manifest. I think in the smaller scale I do, like I really need to move into a bigger place. <laughs> so I really like a bigger place. Uh, and I need a car soon, so I probably need a car. But in the bigger scheme of things, I actually I'm so glad you asked that question because that's been a gradual death for me of sorts in having a sense of personal purpose because I feel that the less personal purpose I have in what I do, the less I am filtering or encumbering the messages that are coming through. And a lot of people, a lot of people I know personally and, you know, people who, who love me dearly have often made comments, you know, you need to have more, you need to be more driven in this or you need to be considering your financial position more or you need to be more proactive in how you're get you know making yourself visible but I, I I've dropped personal agenda around that and that in itself I feel if if the masters come through and talk about creation in the joy of creating something and I still have an agenda with what I think that it should be, how it should go, how much money I should be earning. I'm not really walking the talk. So I've actually, I've actually had to drop all of that. And interestingly enough, it, it things seem to be expanding and flowing quite nicely, but there's a lot less mental effort in being concerned about those things. So that goes to my curiosity around freedom. Like, why do people want freedom, right? If personally, um, personally, I desire freedom, but what do most people define as freedom and why are they trying to, to create it? Well, a lot of people think that, you know, money is freedom. And then people will say, well, what does money buy you, buys you time? And then people say, well, time is freedom. Because I think that we need time to create things, which we don't, because creation only happens in the present moment, <laughs> as we discussed. But I feel that what people, what freedom for people really is, is freedom to choose. Choose what experiences they want to have. 
And so we think that if we have money, we can choose the experiences that we want to have. What I've been discovering for myself personally is that we don't actually need money to experience things. Because if we think that the goal is to get money so that we can have choice of experience, we spend all of our energy and time on getting the money and we're not really making ourselves available for the experiences. So we get distracted by the middleman, which hmm. doesn't really need to be there. And the master started talking about this some time ago. I did a seminar probably about seven or eight years ago about the law of availability and money. And they were saying that you don't need money to create the experiences that you want. And when this came through, I thought, well, gosh, I really need to walk the talk if this is, <laughs> if this is what's coming through. And, I, and so I stopped focusing on money at all to the point where I went and got um, a bookkeeper and an accountant because I didn't have one before then. And I wasn't even earning much money, so I didn't really even need a bookkeeper and an accountant. But the reason I did that was so I didn't have to look at any numbers. And so I had no idea what was coming in and what was going out. And to a certain extent, that is still true today. Until I get a thing at the end of the year, I have no idea what's happening. Hmm. And because I'm just choosing from that flashlight we talked about, do I want to do this? Do I not want to do this? And what I've discovered is that the richness of experience that started to happen after I became aware of this law of availability, my energy needs to be available for experiences rather than being focused on making money. I have been some of the most extraordinary places in the world and done amazing things. And I haven't had the money for any of it. And I haven't paid for any of it. And I don't even know how that's really happened, but somehow it just happens <laughs> and it just works out. And it's, it's amazing. And the, the richness of this last six or seven years compared to the 15 years before that, where not really very much happened is, is quite breathtaking. So I am absolutely in my truth. When I say you do not need money to have amazing experiences that your consciousness desires you to have to continue your expansion. So availability, being open to the experiences. Oh, the law what? of availability. But there's so many people out there saying manifestation is having that experience prior to the actual manifestation in this physical reality. Is that too experiencing it? Like you don't need to... You mean feeling it? Yeah, before feeling it. Before it happens? Yeah. Well, the feeling state, of course, is the point of creation. And I love that too, because you can take that a step further. So yes, that is so, because if the body's saying, yes, I can feel it, then it's quite likely that it's going to turn up in your reality materially in a slow motion way. But the other thing too, is that when something emerges like that and you really want to, oh, I've just lost, we've just lost the train of thought. Let me just mm -hmm. bring them back in. So the importance too, is that oftentimes you don't really know what you want. We're going to, we're just going to dive in a little bit more. Is that okay? You might as well just bring them in. <laughs> yeah. Interestingly, humans think that they know what they want to create. But if they know what they don't want to create, they're wanting to recreate what already exists. So they want something the mind has already identified. And in this way, it's not really a creation at all. It's a recreation. It's a perpetuation of history. And this is why you have history repeating itself. This is why you have experiences through different lives repeating themselves with the same themes. It is our view and the human capacity at this time to actually expand beyond this perpetual loop of experience. So when you move into the state of, I don't know what it is that I want, it's very important. It's a precursor for that creation. Because if you don't know what you want, then something can arise that ignites you that, that is something new and this is important because many humans they come to a point of success to a certain extent or they come to a point of awareness to a certain extent and then they become disillusioned disillusioned of course because they now they don't know what they want hmm. and in that i don't know what i want is the unhappiness but it's actually only the mind that is unhappy because the mind cannot predict or create if it has no reference. 
So when you sit in that state of, well, I don't really know, or I don't really know how to do it, or I don't really know anything, this is the moment in which you actually evoke, well, how about this? Well, here is this possibility. But we would invite you to ask your question again. I don't even know what I asked. <laughs> I was in the moment. Now it's gone. Um, lost my train of thought. I do want to know, however, um, how do we create our realities without being narcissists? Well, what's fascinating about the human condition is that you live within a reality where everything is mirrored to you. You've often heard those refer to the third, fourth density as a mirror reality. And so to a certain extent, it's designed to reflect life to yourself. It's usual for a human mind to always refer everything back to itself. Of course, in doing such, you cannot create anything new. Because again, you have this oscillation effect, light bouncing off two mirrors. It goes back and forth infinitely. When you begin to step back and begin to feel yourself as something other than a reflection in a mirror, I am greater than this. I can feel it. There is more to me than this. You yourself have asked the question, there must be more than this. There must be more than this. And it begins with you. I must be more than this. And so when you begin to feel that magnitude within you, you realize that you are more than this. And so you become less interested in that image and how you are seen in the world and how you are appearing. Your self-consciousness disappears and you now become more fully aware that I am creating because I can create, not because you want to alter the image in the mirror. Narcissism is where all of your movements and creations and your expressions are specifically to adjust or reinforce the image of reflection of yourself in the mirror. There's no one else there. It's just you. When you become aware of the greatness of yourself, you're not interested in your human appearance. You're not interested in how others are viewing you. You're not interested in how you're viewing yourself. You're only interested in the grandiose expression of what is possible here. It's exhilarating. Hmm. So when you say there's no one else but myself, what does that mean? Like this is this reality is a mirror that I'm looking into it. Does that mean like the the relationships, the conversations, the experiences that I'm having with other people are just an illusion that it's actually myself the entire time? Well, of, well, we would say there is only one source consciousness. And as that, you are an aspect and appearance of it. But within the mirror reality, everything is about you. And of course, when there are the metaphysicians that say, well, every aspect, every relationship is actually you and actually your consciousness, to a certain degree, this is correct because of the mirror effect. Everything is what you believe being demonstrated to you. And this is why manifesting within that metaphysical composite is all about what you believe is what you experience. But at a certain point to expand beyond that and into fifth dimensionality and beyond, the human must be willing to say, I don't know what to believe. And I'm now interested in creating beyond belief. And this is where you really begin to bring new and somewhat miraculous expressions, ideas and concepts into your field of awareness. You're no longer interested in the game of how reality is reflecting it back to you because you stop looking for the results, you stop looking for the instant feedback, and your focus is now on what else is emerging, what else is emerging, what else is emerging. You become the source of creation itself. And this is why there are certain beings on your planet at this time that seem to have these continual flow of ideas and inspirations that have become very influential because all they're interested in is what's going out. They're not interested in what's coming in. 
Hmm. So I have a question for you regarding this reality being a mirror. So when things happen, right, um, specifically for me personally, and I'll, I'll go out on a limb and sacrifice um, a story, personal story for the audience. So in the last year, the house, for some reason, has lost Freon and we lost our air conditioning right around summertime. Uh, the refrigerator lost Freon and it lost its ability to cool. And then just recently, our truck lost uh, its Freon and lost its ability to um, provide us with AC, you know, all these luxuries that we have now that are actually, you know, like, you know, create an experience for us. But what does that mean? Like, what is that mirror reflecting to me? Is it that I lose my cool? Is that associated with that? Like that I'm losing my cool in moments, like from your perspective as a, as a master, of a higher dimension like what does that mean for you well we do enjoy the humor of the earth reality of course but let us say this to you humans will often misinterpret a great drive and passion that arises within as anger and this can be seen as destructive in your experience, there is a great passion that is arising with you, and you have been attempting to cool it, to cool it, to keep the space comfortable for everyone. I don't want to really follow my passion or my spontaneous burst of what it is that I actually really want, because if you did that, you would walk away. You would walk away, not from your family, but you would walk away from where you spend most of your day. Yes. And so your experience is showing you, well, the passion is rising. The heat is here. Everyone's getting very uncomfortable. Yes. It's getting very uncomfortable because you're not actually allowing it to be expressed fully. You cannot keep trying to artificially cool this passion. <laughs> so uh, what's your advice? So what we would say to you is this. You believe that you are alone in this. And that it's all on you and it's your responsibility. And that if you move forward with your passion, that it will all, the onus will all be on you. And that's an incredible weight to bear. Agree? Mm -hmm. And what we say to you is that moving forward with this passion, the reason you have this passion arising within you is because you have an entire support team that is enabling that to be felt and bringing you into awareness that you are not shouldering this, you are representing something. You are the representative of a rising human curiosity. You are a representative of a wisdom that humanity is ready to hear. You are a representative of an intelligence that arises within you when you ask certain questions. You are representative of the wisdom that humanity is ready to engage with. And if you are representative of this, then you are not responsible for it. You are merely expressing it. Because there is also fear within you, and we're going to be very direct, that perhaps you will be rejected. And it's not that you will be rejected by individuals, that you will be rejected by humanity. You will be rejected by society and no one will be interested in what you are doing. But you cannot be rejected or have fear of rejection if you know you are representing a great consciousness. That support system, is that in the non-physical or is that in the physical? Well, in this moment, it's in the non-physical and will always be, but it will also manifest in the physical in any number of ways. It can be partnerships, sponsorships, audience, invitations. Yes. Because you are the one that invites, but when are you invited? Hmm. <laughs> Yes. When yeah. are you invited? When am I now, invited? See, 
See what happens with your body when we say that. When are you invited? Interesting. Yes, when are you invited to speak? When are you invited mm -hmm. to share your wisdom? Yeah, when, when is that? You know, that is the question, you know. And yet the intelligence in your body is very vibrant when we say these things. So what does that mean that it is coming or is that like, do I need to be strategic in implementing that? What it means is the intelligence in your body recognizes it as an expansion opportunity for your consciousness. And if you are clear that your focus is, I want experiences that continue to expand my consciousness, then that is very likely to emerge in your field of view. <laughs> so again, like my mental mind wants to go into this space of like, you need to start planning those opportunities. But to your point, will they arise, right? Like, do I need to be proactive in that to manifest that? You need or to be available. And you are available if you are daily declaring, I am, in, I am available for whatever experience is going to assist the expansion of my consciousness. Because that's the reason you're here. That's the reason I'm here, or is that generally for like generally? That's, that's the purpose of everyone, right? Of course, to expand our consciousness. But yes, but personally, I guess, or individually, like, what is the purpose? You know, for me, I feel like, and I told myself I wouldn't ask you guys this. Like I said, I will not make this personal about me. However, here we are. <laughs> it needs to be personal because being a human is personal. Mm -hmm. This is the experience. This is the human experience. You cannot separate the collective from the personal experience. You cannot separate them. And so therefore, if the purpose here for you is to expand your consciousness, as it is for all humans, because you are aware of this, you can now be saying, well, I'm not going to just expand my consciousness in my spare time. Now, everything that I do is going to be for the expansion of my consciousness. Because that is your primary focus. And you would wish it to be your primary focus, but there is a mind that says, but you have other responsibilities. Mm -hmm. But that is the only responsibility that is worthy of your presence here in the earth reality, in our view. How do, from your view, how do you experience reality? We experience it with a very wide aperture. And it's not a wide aperture that just enables us to see the microscopic and the macroscopic, but also all of the potentials that are possible for humanity. And indeed, we are here at this time to assist and remind humans as we usher them into a new era of consciousness. This is not narcissism. This is self. And isn't that interesting, a dualistic concept? There's self-awareness where it's narcissistic, it's too much, but that's within the mirror reflection. And then there's self-awareness where you're completely devoted to the expansion of your own consciousness through experience, that that becomes your primary focus. That does not render you a selfish, narcissistic person. It actually elevates you into a very compassionate, aware, an influential being. Because there is a fear within humans, and it's a very clear programming within your mental and your genetic composition that says, if I step into my greatness, I will sacrifice. You've seen this in all religious practices. If I step into my greatness, what do I need to sacrifice? And this is indeed where the notion of blood sacrifice has become so potent within your programming. Because there is a fear, if I actually make my life about my own greatness, I will sacrifice my family. I will sacrifice my safety. I will sacrifice my standing in society. Can you see what a clever mechanism it is? But isn't there a potential for that, though? Right? Like, if you were to, let's say, create a, I don't know, a um, leave of absence or a um, resignation and you start doing what it is, what it is that you're passionate about. Like there is a, there is going to be a period where you are going to be in the unknown, but isn't there a potential for that? Right. To, I mean, there, obviously you can say that there's potential for you to be abundantly successful. And then there's also a potential for you to basically self-destruct, but, um, 
like how do you know right like how do you know when you're in that unknown like i guess going Well, you back don't, to the flashlight but you keep your focus on the flashlight, yes. But you keep your focus on, I am here for the experiences that will give me the greatest possible expansion of consciousness. And so if you are clear that that is your focus and that is your daily devotion, then if it is for your greater consciousness, for you to become very successful in what you believe to be successful and become more visible and have more conversations and learn even more, then so be it. If it is required for the expansion of your consciousness for you to have a complete collapse, then so be it. But you can imagine that that collapse would occur if there is more of a narcissistic element in that experience of expansion. How does like one's individual consciousness evolution affect the whole, right? Like, so the more that I awaken or the, the more that I expand my own consciousness, how does that affect consciousnesses at a higher or even lower, I guess, level? Well, we you want enjoy to call it that? your question because it is delineated in a dualistic way of cause and effect, which of course only exists within your earth reality experience. So if, if it's collective consciousness that's evolving, therefore personally, I will also evolve. If it's a personal evolving, I am somehow impacting the collective consciousness. Yes, there is one and then the other. But of course, in true reality, from our perspective, in a state of timelessness, they both occur simultaneously. which means that the evolution of human consciousness is inevitable and the evolution of your personal consciousness is inevitable and it's happening simultaneously. But how do you keep your awareness of who you are, right? Like as the ascendant master of whomever you may be right now, but like how do you keep that awareness of self, I guess, or identity of that particular energy? This is an excellent question. One of the principles of your earth reality experience is that you are identifiable. You are identifiable to others. There is a point of differentiation that begins in your genetic composition that renders you identifiable to anybody else. Agree? So in that design, you are most identifiable, not through your appearance or your name, but through the role and the function you play in society. That's what makes you identifiable. You are this person's father. You are this, you work in this industry. This is my role. Yes. So it's the roles that reinforces the identity. You will never lose your ability to be identifiable as long as you are in this earth experience. However, it will be more difficult for you to have a discernible role. And this is actually a signature of an evolved being. Because the more expanded you are, the less you are designated a specific role. Which means that you are losing your identity, and it may feel like you're losing your identity, but you're not being identified through specific roles by others. Which means you're expanding beyond the containment of that assignment. And this is evolution. This is what it means for humanity. It's why so many humans are going through an identity crisis at this time. You're even going to see nations go through an identity crisis. Religious institutions go through an identity crisis. Because how it used to be in your reincarnation cycles is that once one role was finished, there would be a physical death and then there would be a new life and then a new role. It was very unusual to change roles within a life experience. But in this life experience, you're already seeing people are changing roles throughout one particular life expression. That's going to accelerate even more to the extent where you're shedding all of your roles. So I don't really know what my role or function is to you, but this is what I enjoy doing. And this is what I am expressing on this day. And so be it. So you become very fluid. So it's wise for you not to become attached to your roles. What do we experience after death? Like how, is it a remembering or is it confusion? Is it, um, belief systems? Like, what does that look like when we leave the body? Do we immediately go back to the one? Like, what does that look like? Well, yes, 
all of that. It depends on where you're viewing from. Because if you're asking the question and viewing from the mind upon death, then of course you will experience it through the construct of your beliefs, which is why there is familiarity with others and there are certain aspects of that experience, the, the after death experience that humans then return to express that are within the containment of their mind's capacity to see and believe. That's why it's slightly different for others, but there are often elements that are similar through all. Hmm. From our perspective, when there is the discontinuation of the physical experience, all returns to source. And as it does so, the human mind and memory fades because that's another identity and it dissolves as it returns to source. In that period where it's dissolving, there is memory, so there is a recollection and review. There is recognition because there are references to certain aspects of life or relationships that were very important to you. And then there is just the one. That is just the one light. The one, is that the void? Well, it's interesting, isn't it? Because one may say it is the all and one may say it is the nothing the alpha and the omega. So yes, the void, and yes, also the light. I've heard of people experiencing the void and having this sense of complete and utter loneliness because they realized that it was them the entire time. How do you, I guess, deal with that, right? Like you become the void, you are the one, you're the only one. Like well, again, it's the mind's interpretation. And so what we would say is that that wasn't the experience in the moment that they experienced the void because it's an utter state of peace. It's the utter state of stillness. And in that moment of stillness and peace, the expansion is beyond human comprehension. But when the mind seeks to interpret it, it then references empty space as isolation, as loneliness. So it's a retrospective experience and view in that moment. That is a mind interpretation. That is what so, we say. So consciousness in itself is always evolving? It is always creating new, yes. And it does that through the appearance of evolution within your field. We use the word evolution because your minds are still very familiar with a time scale. So does that mean that one consciousness is still evolving and that it's not perfect? Or is it? We that would say that it all, it, all that it is and all that it possibly could be, and in the third, fourth density, such as your earth reality, is it experiencing itself becoming all that it can and all that it possibly can be. Because remember, the earth experience is the slow motion replay of what already is. How many levels of experience are there? When you say levels, do you mean levels of awareness? Or do you mean dimensional levels? Awareness. Infinite. Even in every even in every sentence that you have, you are having multiple levels of awareness, which is indicative of your multidimensionality, which is also infinite. How many can you see how many lives I'm living right now in this moment? Multi multidimensionally. Of course, but to put a number on it would be somewhat cumbersome hmm. if you truly believe that everyone is an aspect of the one then you are all of the lives to billions simultaneously. of course which is why your scientists are now discovering that even the flicker of your finger affects hmm. something in another galaxy so Speaking to the Atlantean um, consciousness that you carry or that we carry, I've been fascinated with artifacts recently and just watching documentaries on like the Staff of Ra, the Holy Grail, things of that nature. Is there a mechanism here in this physical reality that is a key or are, the, are these keys to a mechanism that will help the evolution of consciousness like or something of that nature? Well, we would say that the most important aspects of these, what you call artifacts, is that the is the vibratory quality that they emit. 
because they are created with specific vibration. And this is something that humans have not truly perhaps encompassed yet, that it is not the functionality in the physicality of such artifacts, but it is the vibratory signatures that they carry that are of most importance. Is that why the pyramids are such important uh, structures to where they, I think they are, I think they are related to vibration, right? Like They are, but they are construct, in our view, they are constructed vibration. A very clever design of constructed vibration. But there, I've heard people speak to, there are rooms, there's like the king's chamber, there is like a another smaller chamber that's that prepares you for the king's chamber. But when you go in there and um, it resonates or they do these little, little, I guess, ceremonies inside that create a vibration and the body feels that is that is that attuning yourself to let's say a god state or a god tone or something of that nature to help you become more aware of who you are or maybe give you an upgrade we would say that is a very rudimentary explanation yes <laughs> rudimentary so without having to go to the pyramids and step into these king's chambers or these pre preparation chambers of higher frequency and vibration, what are some daily practices that I can do to resonate at those levels of frequency so that way I can step into my creative power? It's actually quite simple because such constructs are created for those who have not evolved to the magnitude to which they realize that all vibrations are available within. So again, bringing it back to the intelligence of your body, which is multidimensional in and of itself, not only do you not need to be localized to experience that vibration, you can also experience it whenever you wish, but it cannot be done with the mind. So if the mind says, well, I want to experience what it is to be in that particular vibration, it will give you an image and it will try to direct you to that vibration. It cannot, it does not know the way. And so therefore we would suggest that you actually just relax into your body. I wish to have the expanded experience of what it is to be in that particular construct, have no idea of what it looks like, and actually just allow the body to radiate that ra radiance of that energy from the inside to the out. Because so many humans, they have this understanding that when you sit in a vibration or you receive a vibration, I am receiving it. It comes from the outside in. I'm experiencing this because I'm sitting in this energy. It comes from the outside in. And yet that is not the mechanics of it. Rather, it comes from the inside out. And so being in that space, it creates a reference point that the body then attunes to and begins to express. But you do not re require to be in that location necessarily to still have that energy expressed. How malleable is this reality? I feel like stories of the non-physical or the near-death experiences that I've heard and the people that I've interviewed, it seems like that space is very malleable where <clears throat> thoughts create things, or I guess thoughts can immediately create a, a totally different reality or realities. But here in this 3D world, in this third dimension, how malleable is this reality? Can we affect change or is it just probabilities that we're affecting essentially it, it, it's all malleable nothing is solid in your reality nothing and it's interesting when we watch humans try to be solid this is my name this is my identity this is where i live this is where i am part of the experience of the evolution of human consciousness is humanity awakening to the realization that nothing is solid this is what the buddha was speaking about Nothing is permanent, nothing is solid. And therefore it is just as easy to manipulate matter as it is to manipulate an energetic or etheric field. Now, if we said to you, what is the simplest way to, 
to manipulate change or adjust an etheric or energetic field, what would you say? Thought. You could say thought, but as we have suggested, the thought is not as powerful as we once believed. So feeling it, the experience. The feeling state of the body. And when you're in the feeling state of the body, it's easy to manipulate, shape, and change reality. This is what many of the Eastern masters and what you call martial arts have discovered, yes, that when the intelligence is in the body, nothing is solid. Matter can be changed. But let us not under underestimate the potency of sound. Hmm. Sound. Because indeed, this is a very simple tool to use to shape the fluidity of reality that you are in. When you see sound on water, what does it do? It creates ripples. Creates ripples, it creates geometric patterns. Cymatic technology is something very, very inherent to the Atlantean sciences, for example. How did they use those sacred geometries, right? Like well, the... sacred geometries are representations of sound in your field. You see it more easily with water, perhaps, because water is representative of the viscosity of your plasmic field. But those geometries are all sound imprints. And when you imprint sound onto your reality, it changes the scope for possibility. You may have heard many speak about the blueprints for reality, the blueprints for human experience, or your personal blueprint, how those blueprints created. They're created with an imprint into the fabric of your reality. And that imprint is created principally through sound. So the, the study is done by Dr. Emoto on water and the effects of positive affirmations and the crystallization of water? Like, was that the sound of a positive affirmation that had the effect on water, or is it the energy behind it? Well, the sound is the delivery of the energy in a more magnified, amplified way. Even language, if you put a word in language, it will still imprint upon your reality, but less potently than sound itself. Are there certain sounds that are like we can put in our, I don't know, listen to, right? Like um, that can enhance our ability to, to create? There are certain sounds that can assist you in feeling more of yourself and that you would attune to that capacity within you, but let us not underestimate the importance of emitting your own sound. Isn't it interesting that your passion is your ability to speak? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What reality are you shaping with your activity? Interesting, isn't it? What is an imprint upon your reality? Is that how new beliefs are generated and introduced? Isn't that fascinating? Absolutely. I think it goes into being... When I speak, I know the consequences of my words. And I want it to come from a, a, I want to connect with something, intelligence, that allows me to speak truth or, the, you know, about evolution, about consciousness, about the things that, that I feel in my body are true to me. And I want them to be in a way that is understandable for people. And this is a question that I asked Rebecca earlier to how do I meet people where they're at to where they can hear the words that I'm saying so that it sparks con or sp sparks curiosity and or carries that information to them that may have a, di a direct result on their evolution. Of course, but this is also being on the periphery and trying to get into the middle. Agree. <laughs> I do. How can I reach the how can I reach the majority? How can I be understood? And that's a question of the mind. It's not a question of your authenticity. So what we would suggest to you is that you become very clear, as has been suggested, that you are a representation 
of consciousness and therefore you are less concerned with the responsibility of being understood and you are more concerned in being the most authentic and accurate expression of this wisdom. How do I and know so I'm being that accurate representation though? Because it flows. And we watch you because when your mind gets involved and it tries to edit, yes, to make it understandable or translatable, you feel the staccato in it. The, thought, the flow of that wisdom almost becomes disrupted, yes? And mm -hmm. so we encourage you to trust in an uninhibited way that that which rises for you knows exactly how to be expressed with exactly the perfect tonality and sound frequency that acts as a magnetic experience that brings people to you. And what you begin to discover is that it doesn't matter how it's articulated as long as it's authentic because 50 different people will hear it in 50 different ways and they will hear it in a vibration that attunes with their vibration. And so everybody will hear it differently, but people understand it very powerful yes i know you're in a space of no time but i know that we've gone on a really long time so and you have responsibilities yes um very thank well. you so much for coming in and speaking to my audience and to me directly i feel like i feel the effects of that immediately and i can't thank you enough Thank you very much for having me. It's been a really amazing conversation. Thank you for all the wisdom that you brought to it. Are you back now, Rebecca? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> How can people find you? Where can they connect? Uh, oh, I have a website. That's my name, RebeccaDawson.com. And uh, I have lots of offerings on there and lots of free content uh, and a membership community if you want to have conversations like this all the time <laughs> all the time that's what i'm talking about you don't have to go worry about where you're going to find your next conversation out in the community because you can go right to your community on the website and connect for a small price yes and there's lots of free content there too we like to make it as widely available as possible absolutely any last words that are on your heart right now that you feel like people or someone listening to this needs to hear Yes, I want to thank you for being so authentic in describing the challenge in that leap of faith between doing what you think you have to do and doing what you really want to do. And I want to encourage anyone else who's listening who's feeling that to trust that if it's for the expansion of your consciousness, it's ultimately going to be good for you. <laughs> Heard that. Rebecca, thank you so much for taking the time. This has been fantastic. Thank you, Trey. Thank you.